Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Black Belt Academy of Surgical Skills. It appears that I've had a hiccup starting this evening, and I do apologize. If this is your first time, welcome, thank you for joining. And if you're returning, thank you for supporting the Black Belt Academy. 2,000 people watched last week's lesson, and I'm delighted that it seems to me making sense. And I'd be grateful if you could share it with your colleagues and keep the likes and comments coming through. Today, we're going to be talking about being better at skin closure. Funny that, BBAWS. We're going to be employing some of the principles that we've talked about to date with incisions and needle rotation and applying that to skin closure and highlighting some of the pitfalls and important elements. To my mind, the scar is your signature as a surgeon. And by way of an example, I have here a stenotomy scar at four, three days and another stenotomy scar at six weeks. Now, although I don't remember the names of these patients, they will look at that scar and they will remember everything I said and did with them pre-op, operatively and post-op for the rest of their lives. Your skin incision and your skin closure is your calling card and therefore it is important to get it right. And I've always been surprised at the end of a long operation the senior surgeon often leaves theatre to allow the training surgeon to close. And everybody is tut-tutting and tapping their watches and wanting you to hurry. And I don't think due diligence is paid to closing the skin when you think that that is your signature. So I'd like you to think again on closure. I'll show you mine there. Training of mine did five, six fusion in my cervical spine. And what I like about that incision, it is sitting in the skin crease and you can see it's almost disappeared. And I remember Jake forever for that incision. And I think it's thanks to his handiwork. Funnily enough, he was one of my trainees. So the skin closure starts at the very beginning of the operation. And I'll explain why as we go through. I'm going to take you over to the overhead cam. You should now be used to that. And I've got some pork belly here. It all starts with a skin incision. And we've explained that previously with a knife. And I will not go through it in detail. Suffice to say that your incision should go through the full thickness of the skin throughout the length. And it's sharp dissection, so nice clean edges. And to reinforce my point today, I'm gonna to make this deeper because I want to talk about closing all the layers properly, because unless you do that, you're not going to close the skin accurately. The skin, will only fall together properly if you've brought the layers together properly. And I've often seen, particularly with stenotomy wounds, as I leave the table, everybody's so keen to close that I would say it is cobbled. So over and over stitches can be used for skin, but usually they used predominantly on the deeper tissues. And what I find is that people putting these stitches in, pulling them through, and I'll just demonstrate this in a second and tie that down. That they literally cobble the tissue together. And what's worse is I see people putting a stitch through 
and putting it through again. And then, as if an ox is pulling a cart, pull them all and pull tight. And you see there, that tissue is now strangulating. The whole idea behind sutures at every level, even at tissues, is to oppose the tissue, not to strangulate. So each of your sutures at the deep levels must be deliberate and one centimeter apart and one centimeter deep. So it's outside the inflammatory lag area of the wound healing. Over and over stitches are hemostatic. And if you pull them too tight, they will strangulate rather than oppose tissue. And yes, you can use an over and over stitch on the skin, but I wouldn't recommend it. And the only time that I've used an over and over stitch is in an accident emergency when somebody had been bottled in the head and they had a large gash that was bleeding profusely. And the only way to stop the bleeding was to stitch it with an over and over stitch. The stitches of a continuous stitch can cause strangulation. And if you don't put them in properly, you will actually cause ischemia and problems to the tissue. So the other thing to note when closing the skin is that all the deep tissues need to be opposed very carefully. And one of the examples that I think was the most difficult is closing a proper thoracotomy and closing the tissue layers accurately. Because if you don't, what happens is that patients end up with a bunched up skin posteriorly, bunched up muscle, and they're going to be sitting on against that on their backs for the rest of their lives. So the choice of skin suture, I think, really comes down to whether this is a clean operation or a dirty operation. Now, in dirty operations or in lacerations, by definition, there's a potential of, complete, of, of debris in the tissue and contamination. And therefore, the best stitch in that circumstance to use would be simple interrupted sutures to allow any exudate. But if there's any doubt about the amount of exudate and you've got a significant space, I would always advocate a drain in those spaces to remove the exudate and put that on simple suction, concertina squeezy suction, and that is enough to actually hold the tissue together and remove the exudate. Remember that in the pathology lab, the blood agar plate is exactly that. It's blood agar at body temperature. And imagine any collection in a space like that is the perfect Petri dish for bugs. Remember also any foreign material in the wound will add to wound infection as well. So I'd advocate absorbable sutures closing the tissue layers. In my case, a stenotomy is 22 centimeters long. And indeed, if I have any doubt, I would close it with simple interrupted sutures because that protects the skin, everts it, and stops it from becoming ischemic. But the common stitch is a subcuticular stitch. And in that circumstance, I use a monocrole, which is an absorbable monofilament, and I prefer a straight needle. Some people use a curved needle. But when I bring this in, I bring it in on the outside of the wound to the inside, and I don't lock it or tie a knot on the inside. Because what I've noticed, certainly as I've tried to perfect my stenotomies and reduce wound problems, that any knot with a monofilament at this end tends to give a surface for biofilms and often find a little bit of infection. So the subcuticular stitch, then I start from the outside, bring it into the wound, and immediately start my stitch. Now, as you do this stitch, you are literally doing, as it says on the can, subcuticular. And to do that, you need to come in 
to the subcuticle immediately opposite where you came out. And the best way to do that is come slightly back. And the idea is that you get your suture forming a perfect ladder on either side. I do find that using a curved needle ends up with a crinkle cut appearance. And I think that crinkle cut also is pulling it too tight. So when you put your suture 90 degrees across and you gently pull it together, the two edges should sit perfectly together like that. All right, and I, I find, as I said, the curved needle somewhat awkward because it does give you a crinkle, what I call a crinkle cut appearance. And that is why I prefer straight needle. So if you're going in and out, it should sit down perfectly flat like that. In contaminated wounds or irregular wounds, the best thing to do then is interrupted sutures. And an irregular wound, you'd often see if you have excised something from the skin. Imagine that as a lesion. And again, the knife is perpendicular to the skin throughout. And I, if that's the pupil, I've drawn the eye around the pupil and then proceeded to excise the lesion. But if you start stitching an irregular lesion, from one side only, what will happen is that you'll end it up with it being irregular and bunched up at one side. So with all irregular lesions, it is best to start closing the skin from each side and work towards the middle. And again, a simple interrupted suture is important that I'm using the forceps to reflect the skin and place the suture to make sure I come through at 90 degrees, exactly opposite the last suture. Okay. Um, just got myself a little angle there. And then you throw and tie a knot with an instrument. Now instrument ties, there's two throws around the instrument, Grab the short end, you pull it down flat, and then you can lock it by pulling it back and it holds it in place to enable you to throw on another few throws. And you lock it off to the side and cut the suture short, such that you can pick it up, but more importantly, doesn't interfere with your suture on the opposite side. And in this situation, as I said, we are going to work from side to side. Note the forceps are everting the skin rather than grabbing it, pulling it through, and making sure your needle rotates 90 degrees through the skin each time. And by taking it through 90 degrees through the skin, you will see that the edges will naturally evert because you've taken the needle through on the rotation. So this it comes back to the principles of stitching and needle angles and taking it through at 90 degrees, ready to pick up again. So just rehearse the instrument tied, two throws around the instrument holder, pick up the short end, pull it flat, lock it over and hold it. Now, the other important thing when stitching is to appreciate the thickness and feel of the tissue. You will know that on the extensor surfaces, the skin is a lot thicker than on the flexor surfaces. You'll also be aware that the skin is a lot softer and thinner and more fragile in people who are elderly compared to the younger generation. And you might need to appreciate that feel as you handle the skin and bring the edges together. So what happens if you've got an irregular wound such as this? and somebody's been bottled. Very few areas in the body are at risk of ischemia. And one of the areas of ischemia would be the lower limb, particularly in the elderly. And therefore, you've got to be extremely careful how you hold the tissue and handle it. And I would not advocate excising any of it on 
first inspection. But remember, every stitch is potentially strangulating. And the simple stitch that is not strangulating is a simple interrupted. And I wouldn't try and bring all these edges together in one go. I'd approximate it away from the central point because that's where it's going to be most ischemic in that area and bring the sutures together with one there, hold it through, one there and bring another one, this side, there and there. And in doing that, simple sutures will simply bring it together and evert a skin. There is a number of sutures that you can employ on the skin. I've already said the over and over suture is potentially strangulatory. And the interrupted suture is probably, simple interrupted, I believe, is the best. And by way of example, and a model that we've used before, is a simple banana model. And you can see here, the idea is that going through this, I've inverted, the two edges are sitting together, and you can't see any overlap. And that would be an ideal skin closure. There is no overlap, there's no gaps, and together. Because not to do infrequently, I see people close the skin, and you see these overlaps. One edge overlapping the other. To help you vert, a vertical mattress suture is useful. It does achieve that eversion, but it is important that you don't do this all the way along the wound because it is itself an ischemic inducing suture. So I'm going to take that suture out and we'll just see what it looks like having been in the banana. And what did you do is go in, come out wide, and then come in just under the cuticle on either side and tie. But that itself is a potential strangulation stitch. It is useful for everting, but is not as accurate as getting simple interrupted. I've seen some people advocate horizontal mattress sutures, going in one side, out, coming across, in again, and out, and a horizontal mattress. But the horizontal mattress is actually, as you can see here, everting the skin edges and potentially causing ischemia. Remember, as you hold the skin, and the banana is a very good example, that two forceps down this side, you can see, have left scratches and holes all the way along the length. And the two forceps are often used to close the skin, but they should be used to evert. My plastic surgical colleagues use tissue hooks to evert the skin to hold it. And you see, I'm not actually closing the forceps. On this edge, I've used Debakey forceps, which are crushing forceps. But you can see these two have left marks along the skin. So the way you handle the skin with your forceps, the way you take a needle through the skin, all determines how well this will heal. And remember, that will be your signature on that patient for life. But there's another important element to this wound healing. And this is this concept of wound infection. And everybody says, debates wound infection. For me, anything less than a perfect wound is a wound problem. Because as soon as we get into the argument of is this infection or not, people say, well, it's culture positive, culture negative, it was slightly red, bit of an exudate that doesn't really count as an infection. No, no. No, any wound problem is a problem. It either requires extra dressings, extra sutures, an extra stay in hospital, but for the patient, it's an extra worry. So if you really want to be disciplined 
about your wounds, I strongly commend that you look at perfect wounds only, and any redness, any exudate, etc., is a wound problem. Wound healing and good wounds start at the beginning of the operation with your preparation, your skin prep, which should be chloroprep, antibiotic timing, your draping, and how well you hold the tissues and how well you stitch them. I would advocate that we spend a little bit longer closing the wound, but pay attention to the edges to make sure they're averted. And if they're not, you do it again. And I know one of my trainees was a little disappointed that I asked him to do it again because I believed he had rushed the subcuticular suture. There's no compromise at all. And it's attention to the correctness and the discipline. So the next thing is, do you put a dressing on it or not? And I know there are a lot of people who would say, leave it open. But I think the wound is going to be waterproof in 24 hours. A simple dressing over the top does one thing and one thing only. It stops the patient scratching the wound, because itching is the mildest form of pain. And a patient I saw at follow-up at six weeks had a wound infection despite my tissue care bundle, and we sent it off for culture. And what we grew from it is a bug that can only be found in the potting sheds of tomato plants. So I actually scraped his fingernails and sent them off to the labs. And unfortunately, the lab threw away the sample, so I couldn't close the circle. But I have no doubt that he would have had that bug under his fingernails. So I think dressings are a good idea. They absorb any exudate that is there. And if it's not, you can take it off. But it stops the patient scratching. The banana model, and I know Charlie's and I have set a competition in stitching the banana and in interrupted sutures. You have a go. It is unforgiving and it's difficult. And if you pull the sutures too tight, as often as the case, you'll see them tearing out of the banana and causing damage. That won't be too dissimilar to an elderly person or somebody on steroids. And if you can actually close a banana accurately and carefully, then I'd say you're probably going to do a pretty good job on the skin. There's nothing difficult in this. There's nothing clever. It's just sticking to the basics and be attending to the correctness in everything you do. I hope this has made sense to you. I'd like you to leave comments, ask questions, and I welcome you to join me next week as we can go back to the beginning of our syllabus and we'll explore the use of the knife. Thank you very much for joining the Black Belt Academy of Surgical Skills. I wish you a good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good day, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much indeed, and be safe.